This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is classical composer Richard Wagner. We'll be talking about his life and career with Mark Weiner of Indiana University, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Mark Weiner is my guest, and the subject is Richard Wagner, the great operatic composer uh, from Germany in the 19th century. Uh, Mark, as I usually like to do, I give my I guess a few minutes to give a little background about themselves. So if you could tell me a little bit about yourself, your interest in Wagner, any books uh, or anything you've written in regards to him. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, well, I've been interested in Wagner uh, for almost 50 years. Uh, he is the composer who uh, most moves me and who most fascinates me. Uh, because I uh, am Jewish, I grew up uh, with um, a certain conundrum uh, having to do with Wagner, and that is because when I was uh, quite young, I started to read about him and I found out that he was an avid anti semite uh, and so I uh, ex simply explored Wagner more and more. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I had the good fortune to uh, go to the Bayreuth Festival in Germany. I was able to get a scholarship from a Wagner Verein, which is a, a Wagner club, basically, in Germany. And um, I went to the festival a number of times. And um, I have uh, I've published uh, a few articles, and uh, in 1995 I published a book on Wagner called Richard Wagner and the Anti-Semitic Imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, five years later, that book was uh, translated into German and published by a German uh, firm. Uh, the book met with um, some controversy in this uh, country. It seemed as though uh, people either praised it or hated it, and that really didn't surprise me very much because I knew it was going to be controversial. Uh, and the book was far more the, the reaction was far more negative in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching courses on Wagner and German culture and German philosophy for uh, 32 years now at Indiana University. And I uh, continue uh, to uh, maintain my uh, sincere interest in uh, Wagner. Um, for some time I was invited to uh, give lectures for the Sh Lyric Opera of Chicago on Wagner and I've written some of their program notes, things like that. So I, I've been involved in a variety of enterprises having to do with Wagner, but um, he's by no means the only thing I'm interested in. There are a number of other features of German and Austrian culture that I've worked on and am interested in. But time and again, I have found myself uh, going back to Wagner. Well, uh, I was going to wait till the end of the show to talk about the Wagner and the anti-Semitism and whatnot, but since you brought it up, I'll sort of reverse uh, positions here since we're doing this, uh, uh, taping this live. Um, uh, let, let's talk about uh, Wagner, because uh, along with uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Wagner is sort of given the dubious distinction of being a proto-Nazi. Um, and yet, there's always the distinction to be made between the artist and the art. Uh, here in America, uh, the American author Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, is often pilloried for his uh, great novel, Huckleberry Finn, and the use of the word nigger. Uh, and people, uh, a lot of black people, even some white people, think that it should be replaced by a word slave. When we talk about uh, 
uh, Wagner, are we talking about someone who within his art was propounding racism uh, or bigotry against Jews? Uh, was he you know, talking about, you know, decapitating Jews in this, the center square in his operas. I'm not an opera fan, I'm asking. So is, is, is the supposed anti-Semitism that he had in his real life, did it filter into his art and did it negate positive aspects of the art? Well, um, Wagner wrote uh, a great many essays, the most notorious being um, Judaism in Music, uh, that were avowedly uh, and explicitly anti-Semitic. But ever since the end of the Second World War, following the Holocaust, there has been a very heated debate in uh, studies on Wagner uh, precisely about this issue. That is, to, the, uh, that is to, uh, to what degree does his anti-Semitism have anything to do with his music and with his music dramas? Mm. And uh, a number of prominent uh, scholars, such as the uh, British uh, scholar Ernest Newman and uh, a number of um, uh, German scholars, such as Peter Wapkewski and Martin Gregor Zerlin, um, and Dieter Borschmeier have uh, argued very uh, sternly that it is reading too much into the works to uh, identify anti-Semitism in them. Mm. Uh, some uh, uh, authors, such as Jakob Katz, who is a Jew, uh, who wrote a book called The Darker Side of Genius, uh, claims, uh, he agrees with the notion that yes, Wagner was an anti-Semite, but uh, he should not allow his anti-Semitism to influence the way we think about his artworks. My project in that book that I mentioned was to refute that claim. I believe that his works uh, are avowedly uh, anti-Semitic. And Wagner was a, I, I think, it, it, to put it bluntly, Wagner was a greatest, greater artist than he was an anti-Semite, insofar as he, um, I believe, based his conceptions of a variety of characters in his works on a repertoire of anti-Semitic stereotypes that were firmly in place in European culture by the 19th century. And by looking at the way Wagner characterizes Jews, even their bodies, uh, the way he, uh, for example, portrays various characters' uh, elevated voices or gesticulations or nervous um, uh, gestures, the fact that they, they hobble about, they don't walk in a straight line, the fact that they are associated with bad smells, um, all of those are from a re widespread repertoire of anti-Semitic imagery. However, Wagner never used the word Yuda, which means Jew, in any of his librettos. So uh, some people have argued that therefore it's uh, simply not fair uh, to claim that there is a direct connection between these very avowedly anti-Semitic racist statements uh, in, in Wagner's essays and his letters and in discussions that were quoted by other people as reflected in Cosima Wagner's diaries and his works for the stage. But I think um, you can simply compare his descriptions of Jews in such essays as Judaism in Music and uh, a 
whole variety of features in the music dramas to see in what ways the music dramas are representations of ideas he associated with Jews. Wagner was above, uh, above all, in many ways, primarily a social theorist. He wanted to change society, and his anti-Semitism simply went hand in hand with his notion of what an ideal society uh, would be like. So uh, that that's the con connection I, I discern in Wagner. So we would be looking at the equivalent here in America of seeing a vaudevillian minstrel show, except the players in the minstrel show would not be wearing blackface, but gesticulating and going, going, you know, hey, mammy, 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 or whatever, but they wouldn't be identified physically. Is, is that sort of a, a, a counterpoint, you know, sort of a, an American counterpoint? Uh, well, I would say that they, not that they wouldn't be identified physically, they might actually... Uh, be portrayed as evincing a number of the physical stereotypes yeah. one associates with African Americans. So, but, so they would be they would be eating watermelons and juking and jiving and, and whatnot, but they wouldn't be dark skinned. Uh, they would not be called uh, African Americans or blacks or niggers. Um, one would simply infer that. Yeah. And and I think that's what Wagner was doing. Well, um, let's let's uh, work our way around uh, towards the end and then get to the music towards the end. Um, let's talk about then uh, uh, your ideas of where this might have come from. From just looking at, at a couple of online sites here about Wagner, uh, he apparently grew up in a heavily Jewish area uh, when he was a child. Uh, a lot of times, you know, people have said uh, similar things, you know, certainly about Hitler, that he had bad experiences with Jews. Uh, do you think that this was a case where his family... Uh, uh, was influential? Were they anti-Semites too? Was he born into a family of anti-Semites, or did, you know, did he grow up and go have to go to a, a mostly Jewish school and get picked on, and then picked on, uh, uh, said, you know, oh, all Jews pick on me, so you know, this sticks in the child's mind. Well, there are a, a couple of um, experiences that he had that I think are relevant in this respect. Uh, first of all. Uh, Ernest Newman and the German philosopher and music critic Theodor Adorno pointed out, as did Nietzsche, by the way, in his uh, uh, text, The Case of Wagner, which he wrote five years after Wagner's birth, uh, they all point out that Wagner may have, uh, that Wagner never knew with any certainty who his father was. Uh -huh. Because his father died um, shortly before his birth, and six months after his birth, his mother married an actor named um, Gaia, G-E-Y-E-R. Yeah. And Nietzsche made a pun in his critique of Wagner, and in that uh, text, you know, the case of Wagner, he even said, was Wagner even a German? Um, he was originally um, called Gaia, but a Gaia, which means vulture, if it's spelled G-E-I-E-R, mm. is almost an eagle, mm. Adler. So Nietzsche was making a pun. He was saying, this vulture sounds a lot like an eagle. That's because the word for eagle in German is uh, a Jewish name, Adler, like Victor Adler, for example, yeah. the Austrian socialist. Yeah. So um, Nietzsche's point and Ernest uh, uh, Newman's point and Wagner's, uh, no, excuse me, uh, Adorno's point later on in the 1960s was that Wagner may have suspected that his father might have been Ludwig Geyer, and he may have suspected that Geyer was a Jew. Mm. But we don't know this. 
just as we don't know whether uh, Hitler wondered yeah. whether he was a, a Jew. This is also something you, you hear. However, when Wagner was 27, he moved to Paris, and from 19... Uh, from, uh, from 1840 to 1842, he worked for a Jewish publisher. He was very poorly paid, uh, and uh, his name was Marie Schlesinger. And um, Wagner had to uh, create piano vocal scores and do lots of hack work, and he had to compose potpourris and gallops and, uh, you know, trivial kinds of music, and he hated it. He felt that he was being exploited, and he hated the fact that uh, Schlesinger had published Beethoven's works, because uh, Schlesinger had gone to uh, Beethoven in, in, to Vienna in uh, the 1920s, and got the rights to publish a number of his works. And Wagner always felt, as he said later explicitly, that Jews controlled the culture industry. They controlled the opera houses. Um, because Wagner had, was never successful in France, he always assumed that Meyerbeer, this very successful um, Jewish composer who had moved to France um, had uh, uh, worked against him, even though actually Meyerbeer had tried to help Wagner. That's documented. That's well known. Uh, and and Wagner refers to Meyerbeer as he does to Mendelssohn in that uh, essay, Judaism in Music. So I believe that his experiences in France uh, very much influenced and led to his, the growth, the development of his anti-Semitism. Well, let me just talk about, you mentioned Judaism in music. Um, I've always found it interesting, uh, just culturally, when people have a bias against someone. Uh, to me, most human beings are... Uh, deadeningly similar, uh, usually in the negative. And I've often said to people, well, how does one uh, take a piss like a Jew? How does one fart like a black person? How does one, uh, you know, pick their nose like a lesbian? And it's like, when we talk about Jewish music, uh, and Mendelssohn was a Jew, I believe, right, Felix Mendelssohn? Yes. Yeah, so what strains would Wagner have seen in Mendelssohn's music, just to use him as an example or someone else, that would say, aha, there's that Jew in that crescendo, you know? Right, right. Well, uh, for example, in Judaism and Music, that essay by Wagner, he writes about Mendelssohn, and he says that Mendelssohn uh, is a typical, uh, a typically assimilated Jew in that he tried to hide his Jewishness, be, and, and Mendelssohn converted to, uh, I believe, Protestantism, uh, and he did so simply for professional reasons. If he wanted to be successful as a Jew, uh, as did many other Jews, like the German poet Heinrich Heine, you, you had to uh, convert to Protestantism or uh, Catholicism. Uh, and so that's one thing that uh, Wagner said. Also, Mendelssohn had discovered or rediscovered the works of Bach. Bach had become largely forgotten by uh, the uh, 1820s, I believe. Mm. And um, Mendelssohn discovered the score to the St. Matthew Passion uh, and he uh, put it on. He he was the music uh, director uh, in, I believe, Dresden, although I'm not sure about that. And uh, he uh, he rediscovered and made popular uh, Bach. And Wagner always resented that because, again, he disliked a Jewish composer who had influenced 
in the music world, um, having control over what Wagner thought of as genuinely German music. And he uh, hated Mendelssohn's oratorios, like Elijah, for example. And he said Mendelssohn was simply trying to copy uh, um, uh, Bach, but he wasn't able to do so. And that's because he wasn't a member of the German community and therefore could only uh, mimic the surface of uh, German music. He couldn't get down to the essence of German music. And this notion of mimic, surface mimicry versus uh, something that is deeper and more authentic is central to many of Wagner's uh, music dramas and, and to his essays. And I, I think it's just another a example of something that Wagner heard in uh, Mendelssohn and that he deemed um, un-German. Well, let me uh, ask about uh, Wagner's youth pertaining to music and how this may have affected his him psychologically. From what I know, and I'm, I've am i been doing this series of uh, shows on composers to learn more about classical music, because as I've gotten older, I've grown more appreciative of the depth and the, the complexity of it versus, say, modern pop music. Um, from what I know, uh, in Mozart and before his time, a lot of these composers, as made uh, famous in Amadeus, basically had to suck up to rich people to, to foot the bills for them. Uh, then along comes Beethoven, and Beethoven is, in a sense, the first guy who could sustain himself without any benefactors. But is it true, then, that by the time of Wagner, you mentioned him working in a hack publishing firm, that that may have dissipated, and Wagner was not, was, was he, he was not a, a prodigy like Beethoven or, or Mozart that, you know, was trumpeted around, was he? No, no. Uh, in fact, his, uh, when he was in his late 20s, he uh, was still trying to compose grand operas. Uh, that was the kind of opera that um, Meyerbeer composed. And, but Wagner was never able to get his grand opera, Rienzi, uh, accepted in France. And uh, he later disavowed that early work and never had it performed in Bayreuth. But uh, subsequently, uh, Wagner got a position as the music director in Dresden, and he moved to Dresden uh, after he had been in Paris. And uh, in, in Dresden, a number of his uh, works uh, were performed. And he was in Dresden during the 1848 revolution, when, uh, during, after which he had to flee Germany. Um, anyway, uh, Wagner got a position um, as the music director, and he was able to subsist that way. But he also uh, traveled around and conducted uh, widely. And he didn't make money from his compositions for a long, long time. So do we have the, the image then of, uh, when you say a long time, did he just become renowned, say, in his middle age? So he had a, a couple of decades where he's basically scraping along and, and this, these resentments are just balling up, balling up, welling up to the point that, you know, I'm, I know I'm great, but these bastards won't let me be. Yes. Uh, for example, um, uh, Maurice Schlesinger uh, instituted a concert series in Paris because he was a publisher and he would often put on concerts of works that he was publishing to make them more popular. And uh, Wagner wanted to have his works uh, performed. And I think 
a Faust overture that he composed very early was performed, but it was a failure. And um, Wagner always blamed Schlesinger and the French. He always hated the French. Um, and it was only much later in Germany uh, that he became renowned. And in large part, that's simply because uh, Franz Liszt uh, celebrated Wagner and Liszt had a very powerful and influential position and Liszt put on the first performance of Lohengrin, uh, for example, after Rienzi Wagner uh, composed The Flying Dutchman and then Tannhäuser and then Lohengrin. Yes. Uh, and then he had to flee uh, Germany. Uh, he goes into exile and for six years doesn't compose, but instead he reconceptualizes uh, art and its relationship, its function in society. And that's when he writes a lot of essays like um, uh, art and mu music and, or, no, art and revolution, mm -hmm. or, or um, uh, opera and drama is a long book that he uh, wrote in which he tried to distinguish between the French grand opera and the kind of music drama that he was going to start composing. And that's when he came up with the idea of artwork of the future, that is, the revolutionary new kind of work. So Wagner essentially took his pol politics and his political activity and transferred it after the failed revolution into his compositional work. And he believed that he was revolutionizing uh, music, and he wanted uh, music dramas to be performed and to have them have a different uh, function in society than they had had it during his youth. He, he hated, for example, the fact that it was primarily French operas that were performed in Germany uh, while he was well, in his youth. And um, it was only later in his life, after King Ludwig II uh, saved him, found him in uh, Switzerland, brought him to Bavaria, and launched productions of Tristan and Isolde, and Das Rheingold and Die Walküre, which Wagner boycotted because he didn't want them performed until the ring cycle was complete. Uh, and Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, um, that Wagner became more and more popular. And, and it was then, through the auspices uh, of uh, King Ludwig II of Bavaria, that Wagner gained tremendous popularity. And that's why, that's when the, the wave of Wagnerism started. And by 1876, then, he launched the Bayreuth Festival. He, with the help of Ludwig II, had a theater built according to his design yeah. uh, that was intended solely for the performance of his works. And there, that, that festival became very influential. And by the uh, 1870s and 80s, uh, there was a wave of Wagnerism in the, throughout Europe and even in America. Um, so that that's what ultimately transpired with well, let me, uh, Wagner. Let me go back, because you mentioned Franz Liszt, and uh, I, uh, for people who don't know, Liszt was sort of the equivalent of the Beatles of his day. I mean, he was... He was yeah. He was the pretty boy with the long flowing hair. He had yeah. women, you know, falling under. I mean, he was he was a rock star before rock. Uh, uh, in he a was sense. a piano virtuoso. Yeah. Yes. And so did Wagner. You said that Liszt had a uh, a good effect of bringing Wagner to the fore. Was Wagner resentful of that somehow, or was Wagner oh, yes. grateful? He he was resentful. No, uh, well, Wagner was very dependent on Liszt. He 
also ultimately married Liz's daughter, Cosima. Um, that was a, an illegitimate daughter of Franz Liszt. And, um, uh, but Wagner never respected Liszt as a composer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some people have questioned whether Wagner got the idea for the main motif in Tristan and Isolde from one of uh, Liszt's compositions, uh, you know, this type of thing you often come across. Yeah. But in general, Wagner uh, had thought little of Liszt as a composer. However, Liszt, he knew, could benefit him because he was so in revered and he's so influential in European music. Yeah. Um, when I've done previous shows about Mozart and Beethoven and, and a, f a few others, um, there's sort of an essential component that each uh, major classical composer has. With Wagner, when we talk about things being Wagnerian, whether it's in, within opera or outside, just using it as a, a metaphor, we think of the grand, the hyperbolic, the 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 piling up uh, upon of uh, metaphor upon metaphor, you know, the ultra meta whatever. Um, yeah. Was Wagner all when you talk about this new art, uh, the idea of a revolutionary art? Uh, did did Wagner look at the Beethovens or the Mozarts and think them small and petty, and this is why he had to be big and huge? Did he want like just as Beethoven wanted to outdo Mozart? Did Wagner want to outdo Beethoven and Mozart and Bach, etc.? Wagner believed, uh, like the true Hegelian that he was, that uh, German music had moved through history and had become instantiated in various figures. Uh, he said when it moved into Bach, it, music still wore a wig, he said. So he said it what hadn't really become itself. Uh, then it moved into Mozart, and he said Mozart really invented the German opera. He said the magic flute was the first German opera, genuinely German opera. He had nothing but reverence for Beethoven. And uh, many of Wagner's works, especially his early works, begin by evoking uh, the beginnings of many of Beethoven's compositions. For example, it's been said that the beginning of the Flying Dutchman with its open fifth is based on the beginning of the Ninth Symphony. Wagner uh, even believed uh, that music, as it progressed through Beethoven's life, was leading toward the word. And that's why in the last movement of Beethoven's last symphony, Beethoven uh, has a chorus. He introduced the chorus into the symphony. And, Be and Wagner felt that he was simply carrying on uh, what Beethoven had started. Mm -hmm. he, he also wrote a short story, by the way, which is a parody of Moritz Schlesinger, and it's called A Pilgrimage to Beethoven. Um, and in that, he has uh, a figure who is based on Schlesinger up here, and he's made to look ridiculous. And he has his protagonist, name, whose name is R, like Richard, uh, meet Beethoven. And Beethoven divulges to R the key to his new symphony that he has composed that contains words, but it has not yet been performed. So obviously it's supposed to take part in uh, 1824. And um, he, uh, Beethoven, Wagner's Beethoven, essentially says to R that uh, music in the future needs to conjoin the voice and the orchestra. The, the voice needs to become like an instrument. And that's the way Wagner used the human voice. Um, you know, Wagner also invented new um, instruments and he invented a new vocal category. He invented what was called the Heldentenor, which means heroic tenor. 
and it's a that's a lower kind of tenor than the Italian uh, lyric or spinto uh, tenor. Uh, uh, El Heldenfenor often begins his uh, his career as a baritone, and then he um, practices and practices and develops the upper register in his voice. So a uh, Heldenfenor always has a bigger and darker sound. Um, a, a number of Heldon Tenors, like uh, Lawrence Melchior and James King, actually began their careers as baritones, and then they moved into uh, singing Wagner um, as tenors. Um, so uh, Wagner uh, was influenced heavily by Beethoven, and he revered Beethoven, but he felt that he was carrying on what Beethoven had, had been doing. He thought he was the next Beethoven, you could say. Uh, you mentioned uh, his dislike for French and French operas. I've read that he was not a big fan of Italian operas. I, I, I got the sense that Wagner looked at opera uh, as sort of uh, being petty and not dealing with grand themes, that it was all about uh, incest or adultery, these petty little divergent diversions of human uh, frailty, whereas he wanted to bring it to the, a mythic stature with these Arthurian uh, characters. Um, is that a correct uh, interpretation? And by doing so, what did he want to infuse in operas that he thought was lacking before he came along? Well, he felt that um, French and Italian opera, with the exception of Bellini, whom he, he very much respected, uh, was uh, basically just uh, frivolous. It was mere entertainment. Um, it was put on uh, for a very wealthy society. He said the makeup of the Paris opera reflects uh, what's wrong with society because uh, the richest people could afford the box seats whereas the, poor, the, the less expensive tickets were uh, located very far up with bad sight lines uh, in the opera house. And uh, the lights were never dimmed in the Paris opera. You know, it was Wagner's idea to dim the lights in a theater. Uh, the, when we go to the theater today and the lights are dimmed before a performance, that's owing to Wagner. Mm. And uh, he felt that um, opera was simply su uh, it was superficial, frivolous. It was just entertainment. It wasn't uh, serious. Whereas he thought of uh, Mozart and Beethoven and uh, Weber and himself, uh, of course, as writing works that were very serious and and lauded Tolkien. Well, let's talk about uh, his progression uh, uh, as a musician. Um, number one, whoops, sorry. Uh, number one, did he ever write symphonies, or were they all, was it basically just operas? Uh, did he start out he, as a symphonic composer and then move to operas? He uh, did write some orchestral music. For example, the piece I mentioned earlier, the Faust Overture, he uh, composed. And later, after he moved from Munich to Lucerne in Switzerland, um, he composed a piece for chamber orchestra, which he later reorchestrated for full orchestra, called Siegfried Idol. And he, he composed that as a birthday present to his wife, Cosima, and he had it performed in the house in Lucerne, um, um, and had the the musicians uh, arranged on the staircase leading up to her uh, room. So, and she woke up listening to this wonderful music that he had composed. It's a very beautiful piece. It's an orchestral, but it contains uh, music taken from his uh, composition Siegfried, which is the third. Rama in the Ring Cycle, and um, 
But so the the Arthurian uh, works, uh, Lohengrin and Parsifal uh, and Tannhäuser, uh, or the uh, the Renaissance work, uh, Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, or the works based on Scandinavian mythology, like the Ring of the Nibelung, comprised of uh, Das Rheingold, Die Valkyrie, or the Valkyrie, Siegfried, and Goethe Demerum, or Twilight of the Gods. Um, all of those Wagner saw as fundamentally different from grand opera and Italian opera. And when we say fundamentally different, he, you mean deeper, uh, more... Well, did he have the sense that that the opera should serve a nationalistic purpose, a, a purpose, a, a political purpose? Yes, he wanted uh, to write uh, German artworks for the German people. Mm -hmm. um, he was not interested uh, in his works being uh, performed elsewhere, uh, even though he did go to France and conduct a revised version of Tannhäuser, but it was a failure. Um, and he, of course, blamed that on the French. Um, but but uh, Wagner felt that the makeup of the grand opera was too heterogeneous. It was comprised of lots of different elements. There had to be a certain number of arias for the tenor and for the soprano. There had to be a certain number of duets and trios um, and quartets. You had to have um, choral uh, numbers. And uh, often in grand operas, there would be scenes in which there, everybody would be on stage. The whole stage would be filled with a, a chorus and all the principals and horses would watch, march across the stage. And he, thought all that was terrible. So when he started composing The Ring after the revolution, in, when he began composing in 1854, after not having composed for six years, he started to compose a kind of work that was very different from the kinds of things he had composed before, namely works that were uh, always developing. He, he called them through composed, meaning that he didn't have arias, but rather he had um, a kind of uh, musical discourse that was far more conversational and loquacious. Um, it wasn't operas and duets and trios so much as uh, exchanges uh, that were sung. Uh, let me just talk about the music then, because uh, we can talk about his ambitions uh, for art within a political context, but what did he bring to the table that differed or set him apart positively as a musician, i.e., um, when I think of, uh, say, Vivaldi or Bach in that era, I think of uh, claviers and, and organs, when I think of the Mozart and Beethoven, when I think of this dense, densely packed music working on multiple levels. Uh, what did Wagner do that fundamentally changed music in his time and after, pre and post Wagner? Well, um, uh, among other things, he expanded the orchestra. The Beethoven orchestra consisted I believe, of about 60 musicians. The Wagnerian orchestra uh, consisted of about 80 or 85. Um, he also invented uh, new instruments. There's something called the Wagner tuba uh, or the Wagner horn, uh, which uh, Wagner conceived of because no instrument existed that could make the sound that he had in mind. Um, so he amalgamated a French horn and a tuba. And um, so his, his orchestral writing was much more 
grandiose, it's much thicker. Um, you know, it's generally said that a Wagnerian singer has to have a big and powerful voice because um, to, to sing through a Wagnerian orchestra requires a great deal of uh, power. You just have to have a lot of strength and stamina uh, to be able to sing him well. Otherwise, you will get drowned out by all those instruments. And so that was uh, one, one feature. Also, he changed um, tonality. You know, music historians generally uh, generally um, distinguish between music before Tristan and Isolde, which was premiered in 1865, and music after uh, Tristan and Isolde, because Wagner so expanded the harmonic makeup of music that he basically infused harmonic music with chromaticism. And it's often very difficult to tell what key the music in Tristan is in. It's always moving around, and the vocal lines are very chromatic. Um, it's not just using a tonal scale as uh, a more uh, a Mozart uh, work would more traditionally and generally be, but his intervals. And the notes he would have singers sing uh, was far more in, well, I guess, I don't know if I should say it was more inventive, but it was uh, less um, tonally uh, secure. Um, I want to talk about a thing I've read that uh, uh, people have said, uh, some film critics, that uh, all of uh, modern film scoring owes its debt to Wagner, even though Wagner died basically about 25 years before even silent films started having in-house scores being played, and uh, almost uh, half a century before sound came into film. Uh, what do you see as Wagner's legacy outside of operas, but within an art form that didn't even exist in his lifetime, notably film. Well, um, it's it's a historical uh, fact that uh, a great many of uh, the composers who worked for um, the cinema in Berlin emigrated to the United States. And um, a number of uh, 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 composers um, uh, uh, excuse me, I may have misspoken what I meant to say before was that directors who had worked in um, in the cinema in uh, uh, the Weimar Republic uh, emigrated to the United States yeah. and uh, composers who had uh, been working in Germany, like, for example, uh, Korngold, uh, moved to Hollywood. And so much of the first uh, film music that was used in Hollywood after the silent uh, films uh, was very Wagnerian in nature. I mean, if you listen to Korngold's opera, Die Tote Stadt, which means the dead city, you can hear Wagner's influence on that. But he then later also composed for the cinema. And uh, a number of other uh, film composers, like Hausmann, uh, for example, uh, were also influenced by Wagner. So for that reason, many composers today like uh, John Williams, say, who wrote the music for Star Wars, um, compose in a very Wagnerian fashion. In fact, many of the motifs from the Star Wars films uh, sound almost like quotes from the Ring Cycle. Yeah. And uh, he did that intentionally. 
There are also some films, like Ridley Scott's Gladiator from 2000, that uh, quote Wagner. Um, and uh, Wagner was also, by the way, um, occasionally used in uh, the German cinema. For example, the Nazi propaganda film Triumph of the Will uh, contains uh, a number of lines from Siegfried, like Siegfried's horn call, also motif, and the sword motif. And it contains a, a passage from the prelude to the third act of Die Meistersinger. Um, so uh, the film scores in general have been highly influenced by uh, Wagner. And that's why, for a number of reasons, um, you're quite right in discerning a Wagnerian character in the uh, cinematic music today. Um, let me just uh, step back, though, to uh, Wagner and his, uh, his ideas beyond art. Um, just looking up, and I know over the years I've read little pieces here and there, that there are some people that almost go to the other extreme, that even though no one denies that Wagner had anti-Semitic views, uh, even early in the show, you seem to, I, f I forget what you exactly said, but you seem to have this idea that uh, Wagner was, in a sense, demotic. You even talked about uh, uh, the sight lines, and him. he seemed he wanted to make his art more demotic and, and less stratified. Um, what, and it is, uh, I guess you'd call it a left-wing interpretation of Wagner, a, a viable one? Oh, yes. In fact, one of the most celebrated productions um, in the history of Wagnerian staging was mounted in 1976 in Bayreuth. It was the centenary of the premiere of The Ring Cycle, uh, which was premiered in 1876. And Patrice Chereau was a young French uh, director uh, whom uh, the conductor of The Ring Cycle, uh, Pierre Boulez, brought to uh, Germany. And uh, Chereau was a Marxist. And he uh, put on a very controversial staging of the ring cycle and traditional Wagnerians were horrified by this because he presented um, the the gods uh, in the ring cycle as though they were um, the landed aristocracy and owners of factories um, and uh, he represented um, the Nibelungs in, um, well, as, as the proletariat, as laborers. And uh, um, so he, he uh, came up with an extremely left-wing Marxist reading of Wagner. And I, I thought it was just brilliant. And it has... Although it was originally met with a lot of consternation, it has subsequently um, been widely accepted as a hallmark in uh, Wagnerian staging, and it became very, very influential. A lot of other productions have been modeled on it and influenced by it. Uh, now that we've got, come through the 20th century, uh, and uh, where does Wagner stand now uh, both uh, as a social uh, construct and also as an artist. I mean, I, very few people uh, would doubt that he was someone uh, of of great stature within music. But all is there's this there's all is this strain which I find particularly noxious, where people cannot separate the art from the artist, as if you know wh whether we're talking about the Me Too movement of, of recent uh, vintage. Um, where do you think Wagner stands now? within the social, historical context and the artistic context? And do you think we're moving more towards the future where 
all of this stuff about his own personal failings of, you know, anti-Semitism or other bigotries that he may have had give way? Do we, are we in the period now where, where we're going to get more to just the art and, you know, Wagner is ancillary to the art itself? Oh, I, I completely uh, agree with you. I feel that is the case. I, I think as time goes, goes on, Wagner's personal failings will become increasingly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, they will just be footnotes to history, mm -hmm. you could say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can well imagine that Wagner's grandiosity, um, his bombast, um, and the exalted nature of his uh, concerns will live on, but the, the fact that he uh, had, uh, you know, personal um, dislikes and hates uh, will become increasingly irrelevant. Um, and so let me just ask you then, uh, how about uh, within... I guess we'd call it the circle of Wagnerian scholarship. Um, do you see that as happening? Uh, and do you consider yourself as one of the people that is leading that charge? Um, I feel that um, I, I would, I, I, I'm, he I'm hesitant to say that I'm leading a, a charge. Uh, I think. The argument that I made in the 1990s uh, had an impact. I mean, uh, I, I think it it was discussed, um, but Wagnerian scholarship uh, now is uh, being pursued in uh, a whole host of different ways, um, and often a discussion of his. Uh, anti-Semitism and the relevance of anti-Semitism for an understanding of his music dramas um, is uh, has become some, somewhat passé, I, I, I feel. It's just not discussed that much anymore. Well, uh, let me ask then finally for you. Um, are you going to be uh, studying or writing anything further about Wagner? Or do you think that you personally have said all you need to say about Wagner? And if if so, uh, where do you think, uh, uh, you know, what do you think is the next big thing within the studies of Wagner and his influence? Um, well, I personally, I currently do not uh, have a project that I'm working on, on Wagner. I, I, may, I, I never know when I'm going to uh, return to Wagner. Um, a, a few years ago, I suddenly got an idea uh, for something, and I, I wrote about that. Uh, I wrote a couple of articles about Wagner. But I don't have a larger book project at the moment. And as for what the uh, near future of Wagner scholarship uh, concerns, uh, I'm simply not sure. I, I don't know what will uh, emerge over the next few years. I, I hesitate to hazard a guess. I don't know. Okay. Um, my final question, uh, I see that you also have studied German film, and uh, the, the person that I find the most Wagnerian uh, in German film post-World War II is Werner Herzog. And I'm just oh, yeah. wondering, what, what do you think of someone like Herzog? And do you think that Herzog is, uh, putting aside the anti-Semitism, because Herzog is clearly a left-wing figure, uh, do you think that Herzog is a Wagnerian figure, artistically speaking, within his medium? That's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, Herzog came to Indiana University a few years ago, about five years ago, I believe, and um, uh, he gave a number of uh, lectures, and many of his films were uh, shown here, and uh, I had 
the impression uh, that he does continue indeed to be uh, very much a, a left-wing uh, uh, director. Um, but on the other hand, he has also ventured into projects that have startled some on the left. For example, um, he did a 3D film in which he went into uh, deep into a cave in France and uh, filmed um, the prehistoric cave. Yeah. Uh, cave paintings. Yeah. And uh, uh, so he's been doing a lot of uh, uh, things that one might say are, are not necessarily Wagnerian. Mm -hmm. um, he's a very inventive uh, director who's interested in lots of different areas and um so i i yeah i don't know whether i want to describe him as a Wagnerian or well not. I, I i was meaning in his own sort of personal bombast you know the the famous short film Werner herzog eats a shoe and his uh yeah. his other uh uh you know dragging the boat across the the cliff or the mountain up in uh what was it uh yeah. the film with uh what's his name uh when, when yeah. with uh Klaus Kinski. yeah yeah and so he, yeah. he, he was known for these, these large, the thing, right? yeah, yeah, Fitzcarraldo, that's right. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, I want to thank you then for spending about an hour speaking about Rick, Richard Wagner. I'll link to your uh, Indiana University page here. Anyone uh, who's enjoyed the conversation uh, can feel free to contact you there. So Mark Weiner, thank you very much. Thank you.